Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, give you the opportunity to make sure you're in fellowship and ready to study the word, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful that we can be here tonight, that we can come together to fellowship, to be with other believers, to be focused upon your word, and that is the real sense of fellowship, to uh, have that partnership around the word, partnership based on the cross, partnership related to who Jesus Christ is, what he did for us, and the fact that we are all members of the body of Christ. And Father, as we study this evening, we pray that we might uh, be challenged in our understanding of what has been accomplished for us at the cross and all that we have in Christ and what that means for how we are to live now that we are believers in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, in keeping with the fact that I'm continuing to uh, give these little vignettes on the trip to Israel, uh, I want to talk about a visit to the Knesset. Now, none of these pictures that I'm using tonight are pictures that I took simply because we were told that we weren't supposed to take any pictures or recording devices or cell phones or iPads or iPods or this or that or the other thing to the Knesset. So we didn't um, uh, get to go. One person took took their camera to take some pictures, and I haven't gotten uh, access to those yet. So these are just some that I took. The Knesset is the Parliament of Israel. We spent the morning at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then we had lunch with the Minister of uh, Energy and Water Water Resources, whose uh, name was uh, Yuzi Navaot, and he was about, mm, I would guess, early 70s, looked like he was in good shape, he talked just like Sean Connery, and uh, gave us a great overview of what was going on. Uh, politically in Israel, especially in relation to foreign affairs. The major issues that they're facing have to do with, number one, uh, what is going on with the so-called Arab Spring, and number two, and the largest problem, is Iran. Uh, I'll just say a couple, I'll say some more things about the Arab Spring and uh, what was covered on that uh, next week. But basically, the Arab Spring is not an Arab Spring at all. It's an Arab winter. And the, you, what we're seeing is a move in these various uh, countries from Tunisia to Egypt to uh, Syria, this, as I talked about on Tuesday night, this movement by, by a lot of radicals. And you have the Islamic Brotherhood. I think there was an announcement today from some leading figure in the, Islam, in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that Christians need to either convert or get out or pay their pay their ta- uh, pay their tax. Uh, Islam isn't any different. People in in the West just don't want to con- can not quite factor in the evil that Islam is and its desire to control the world. And this unfortunately shapes their uh, political decisions. And uh, they want to give everybody equality. But the weakness in any sort of democratic movement is when you have those who come in who don't buy into the assumptions of the general majority and the culture that's there, and they want to take it over. And if they want to do that in a democratic culture, they can do that and then destroy the culture. So that is the weakness because there's no perfect government because human beings aren't, aren't perfect. 
those who hold to a utopic view of, of government and politics who push towards some form of socialism or Marxism uh, have stolen the idea of a future utopia from the Christian and the Judeo-Christian idea of a future perfect kingdom ruled by the Messiah. And then they, they stole the idea and they perverted it because they want to achieve a utopia without the biblical Messiah. And uh, at the very core of their thinking of modern utopians is the idea that man is inherently good rather than inherently evil. And I think this concept of, of the nature of man is so fundamental. Uh, if you want a good explanation of this, just read the first couple of chapters in Thomas Sowell's book, Conflict of Visions, where he shows that this is really the dividing line between liberals on the left and conservatives on the right. There are a lot of other, a lot of issues in life, but it's always interesting, he states in his preface, that, that whatever the issue, whether you're talking about uh, abortion issues, whether you're talking about death penalty issues, whether you're talking about foreign policy issues, whether you're talking about tax issues or business issues, that whatever the question or topic may be, and you say everybody for this get on this side and everybody against it get on this side, the same people tend to line up on the same side every time. What is it that lies at the underlying foundation, the underlying presupposition or view of life that causes certain groups to always align together no matter what the different issues may be or how disparate those issues are? And it's that the conservatives tend to think that man is basically corrupt and evil and that liberals think that man is basically good. Now, I... Uh, uh, it's interesting that within modern uh, that within modern Judaism, not necessarily traditional Orthodox Judaism. Now they don't. We're, tonight we're going to talk about this whole issue of Adam's original sin. They don't have a doctrine in Judaism, even in Rabbinical Judaism, there wasn't a doctrine of original sin. But they do believe that that men are sinners in Orthodox Judaism. But it's not due to a corporate fall as Christians believe, as, as conservative Protestants believe. But in uh, the modern movements that have come out of, of Orthodox Judaism, the Reformed movements which started in the late 1700s, uh, the, the, uh, then those who weren't quite as liberal moved back a little bit, became known as conservatives. They were still liberal, but just not as liberal. Uh, conservative uh, Judaism, and then now you have a new movement that's come up in the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years called um, Reconstructionist Judaism, which is just hyper-liberal Judaism. None of those three major groups believe in any kind of of depravity of man. They all have this 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 idea that man is basically good, so they can man really will be able to uh, repair the world. That's his principle of Tick and Olam, that's pushed beyond uh, a, a Christian view and a historic Jewish view that man should do good to the world, should be involved in blessing his neighbor, as it were, but that ultimately until the Messiah comes, it's, it's going to be a frustrating experience because we live in a fallen world. So you have this split between the, the liberals who believe Batman's basically good on, one, on the one hand and the conservatives who think man is basically evil on the other hand. Now, we always have to come back because there's such misrepresentation of these doctrines and misunderstanding of it today that we have to make sure that we, that we really understand what we're talking about. That the doctrine of total depravity doesn't mean man, every human being is, is, is morally depraved. Not every person is a John Wayne Gacy. Not every person is as evil as he can be. Total depravity, the word total describes every aspect of the human makeup, the immaterial as well as the physical material makeup of man. Every aspect of the human being has been corrupted by sin. That's what total means. It doesn't mean he's as bad as he can be. It, it just simply means that every area of his person has been corrupted, so the potential for extreme evil is there for any single individual. Now, what, one of the things that was interesting on, my, uh, on this last trip was our visit to Yad Vashem. 
and I didn't bring my uh, the book I bought t- brought today. But one of the major uh, events in the Holocaust was a conference that was held in a suburb of Berlin, and I believe it was in 1941. The Von Sey Conference that was uh, came up with the Von Sey Protocols, which was basically an outline of the final solution. And you had 25 or 30 upper level uh, German. Uh, officials who put this plan together, and almost all of the men there were had had PhDs or were of an equivalent rank. There were medical doctors. They had degrees in economics and in politics and in civil service. They were well educated. They were judges, lawyers. Uh, some people think, well, of course they were lawyers. I mean, lawyers are, the, you know pond scum of humanity, but no, no, that's, what I'm, the point I'm making is that they were well educated, they were aristocrats, they came out of a culture and a background training that what they did there would be the last thing that anyone would expect of someone well educated, cultured, and and trained the way they were. And yet what they did was, and the plan they came up with was the most heinous plan that's ever been concocted in the history of humanity, and they carried out a, a, carried it out to a large degree. And as I listened to our docent explain this, uh, the, what kept hit, hitting me, coming to my mind, is how can anyone go through Yad Vashem and see what has happened there and the people, I mean, you have certainly a lot of pond scum that rose to the top among the Nazi party, but aside from people like uh, like Goering and a few others, there were a lot who were involved who were from the upper echelons of, of German society as well and education. How could anybody go through this and not think that anyone could do this because under many other circumstances they never would have had the opportunity to express the depravity of their sin nature in the socially what became the socially acceptable way that they had usually in society and culture there are are norms and standards and laws that restrict our sin nature and most people even though they may want to express their sin nature in certain ways of perversion they don't because of the restraint of the uh, of the police arm of the the restraint of the court system the restraint of the law so it never goes that way but once the rule of law is removed or the rule of law is completely turned upside down then people can get away with with all of the horrible wishes and all of the horrible potential of their sin nature and that's what happened in germany and i just thought how can people go through this exhibit and hear this and come out the other end and think that people are basically good. And that if you remove all restraint, then they will go, up, go move towards the good instead of move towards, towards, the, um, move towards the evil. And so that, that was just in, interesting to look at all of those, all those different, different, uh, different facets. And you see the same kind of play going on. Uh, I think uh, underlying the politics in Israel right now, between the conservatives and the liberals, the conservatives recognize the potential of evil toward Israel because they're Jewish. And you still have a huge number that are uh, not as many in Israel, but you still have a huge number that are are li- liberal and uh, utopic and they can't quite grasp the potential of the evil coming with Iran. And I've even heard this talking to some Americans that, not American Jews, but American Christians who, and the particular individual I'm talking about happens to go to Presbyterian Church, which is uh, holds to replacement theology, and they were expressing their opinion that we just should not, no matter what happens in Iran, it's not worth sending American lives or American soldiers to fight in Iran. And that is a noble, noble sentiment. But let me tell you, if you can imagine Adolf Hitler with a nuclear weapon, it would be worse if Iran had a nuclear weapon. And no matter how horrible 
an attack on Iran might be, no matter what the unintended consequences of that assault might be to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. The alternative of a nuclear Iran holding the, the oil markets of the world at you know, blackmailing them with a nuclear weapon is beyond our comprehension of what that potential can be. And it is, uh, and I think there are those in, among the conservatives in, in Israeli leadership that understand this. And one of those is, the, uh, uh, is of course, the prime minister, but also the vice uh, prime minister, who is uh, Moshe Ya'alon, uh, otherwise known as Boogie. So here's a picture of the Knesset meeting. There are only 120 Knesset members. Uh, they that comes from ten times the that comes from the number of the advisors that Moses picked for for Jethro, ten from each of the twelve tribes. So they, it's a set number. And even though the po- the population continues to increase, the representation in the uh, in the Knesset is the same. And just recently, what three weeks ago. They had a uh, Netanyahu suddenly announced a new coalition, and this brought together ninety a, a, a uni, unity government. And there have only been four unity governments in the history of Israel, national unity governments. And the um, this is the strongest national unity government. The other times was after at the time of the Yom Kippur War, a time of hyperinflation in the 80s and a time uh, when the first Lebanon War in the 80s, and now this time. That's the fourth time. So it's been a time when there's been a national crisis uh, on, on the horizon. And so this puts uh, Netanyahu in an extremely strong position for especially dealing with the the blackmail that that the U.S. is is uh, putting on Israel in some ways. Now, I think a lot of conservatives uh, have gone, have followed some of the rhetoric that has come out of Washington D.C. Uh, toward Israel, and uh, thought that that we're we haven't been too helpful to our Israeli allies. And what I keep hearing over and over again from Israeli officials is that. That that may be on the surface. There may be tension between Obama and Netanyahu, and there may be all this other stuff. But on the ground, the sharing of military intelligence has never been better. On the ground, the the uh, you know, trade, mutual support, all of these other things that go on at a lower level has never been better between the U.S. and Israel than it is today. The level of support for Israel among uh, evangelicals and non-evangelicals in the U.S. Uh, is uh, has just uh, is higher than it's than it's ever been. In fact, Michael Medved has an article. Some of you may listen to him on the radio. Medved is a conservative, maybe Orthodox Jew. Actually, we ran into uh, part of his tour group when I was over there. When I was uh, out working at uh, at Qumran with uh, Randy Price. Uh, we, we were just right by the path that all the tour groups were walking by, and they would walk by and look at us sweating and digging and picking and shoveling and dusting and everything else. And so this one large group came by, and um, I had, we were just walking back from breakfast, and they asked me who we were and what we were doing. And, and um, so I answered a few of their questions, but I had on my T-shirt. And when I turned around and walked to walk away from it, they all had to take a picture of my T-shirt. It's the T-shirt that says, liberals evolved from monkeys, constitutionalists were endowed by their creator. (laughs) They all love that. (laughs) So anyhow, Medved was there. Medved just wrote this article in Commentary Magazine dealing with this support for Israel that that Christians have. And and apparently, in the liberal side of the Jewish community, they, they really don't like the fact that that Israel is getting all the support from conservative Christians, so they're always trying to create some wedge to create more suspicion among the Jewish community for why the Christians are doing it. They come up with all these, oh, the Christians only do it because they want to convert you, they want to get all the Jews back into uh, back into Israel so see Jesus can come back and and you know and and just wipe out all the Christ, all, all, all the Jews when when uh, some nuclear bomb gets set off in Jerusalem or something. They always get these little things related to prophecy all twisted up. But the bottom line is 
they they don't want the liberal, especially the liberal Jews, don't want trust Christians, and Christians are too supportive of Israel, so they want to uh, create this split uh, between them. And Medved made a great point in his article that he was talking about. He made several great points, but he was talking about how conser- con- the the result among conser- the conservative evangelicals is that when Jews live in the vicinity uh, and are closely involved with committed evangelicals, it doesn't lead to their evangelism. It leads to the Jews becoming more religious. Isn't that interesting? And he made the other point. He said, in uh, studies that, that have been conducted in the Jewish community for the last 40 years indicate that that the Jews have more to fear from Jews who don't believe in anything than Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus. Less than 1% of Jews in America have converted from Judaism to Christianity. Less than 1%. But how many have been converted from Judaism to secular humanism or secular atheism? And so he makes that point that, that Jews really don't need to be afraid of Christians. They aren't very effective. <laughs> you know, it's not, not, it's not Jews for Jesus that we need to be afraid of. It's Jews for humanism that we need to be afraid of. So... Um, I thought that was, a, that was an excellent point that he made. But one thing that he missed out on is that, in the, that, that he's saying that in talking about the, the, I think it's like 67% or 65% of the American uh, populace is supportive of Israel right now. And he's, and he's accepting the liberals' view that, well, see, this doesn't have anything to do with the evangelicals. You don't have to believe in Christianity or anything to be supportive of Israel, but they've ignored the reality that what created the culture that is pro-Israel is that the U.S., from from the founding colonies, has had a pro-restorationist viewpoint and a pro-Jewish viewpoint, and that came from Christianity. So just because you have a lot of secular non-Christians today, non-Bible-believing Christians who choose to support Israel for other reasons, the the, the atmosphere and the mood of being pro-Israel is from our Christian heritage and our, uh, our Christian words. But all of that aside, uh, this is uh, Moshe Ayalon, Boogie. And he, um, he spoke to us, and I just want to just hit a couple of high points that he made in reference to what's going on with Iran. He said it is absolutely living in a dream world for the West to think that the negotiations are going to have any impact on, on Iran. That the, the way the Muslim mind works is they have a contract or a peace treaty they call a hudna. And a hudna simply is, is a delaying tactic. It's we're going to sign a peace treaty, but it's only so we get our enemy to, to, to lay down their arms or to be deceived a little bit so that we buy more time until we can eventually accomplish our goal. We're not going to abide by it, but we want them to abide by it. And so that's what's going on here. And so even though uh, we're having these talks right now, there were talks uh, last week, uh, related with Iran, nothing happened. Nothing's going to happen. Anybody who thinks anything is going to happen is living in a dream world. And now they've agreed to meet again in July and have more talks. And see, the liberal mindset believes that the worst possible option is that there's a war. So they'll keep procrastinating, just like Chamberlain did at Munich before World War I, in the hopes that somehow, some way, that this microscopic uh, irrational, impossible chance that that Iran will change its mind will will uh, will take place. All the time, the Iranians continue to enrich uranium. They have enriched uh, 750 kilograms. That's what about 1,800 pounds of uranium to three and a half percent. Remember that number, three and a half percent and 36 kilograms, which is about 80 pounds of uranium, to 20%. Now, 20% is, is sort of the, uh, uh, the Rubicon. You don't want them to cross at all. But the Israelis don't want them to get more than 3.5%. And the day before I left to go to Israel, there was a meeting between uh, the foreign, not the foreign minister, what's Ehud Barak? He's the secretary of state or whatever. Uh, Ehud Barak in Washington with... Uh, Leon Panetta and Hillary Clinton, 
and they're expressing Obama's position that he's not going to go along with the Israeli position that we the Israeli position is we don't want Iran to have the capability to enrich anything beyond three and a half percent because the Israeli position is that we they don't want Iran to have the capability to ever produce nuclear weapons and the express the expression that you get now listen to the difference the expression you get from the Obama administration is they don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. Now, there is a huge difference between those two views because if the, if the Iranians get to where they, have, uh, uh, they can enrich uranium to 20 or 20% 20 or so, then it's not going to take them much more work to get it to weapons grade. I don't know what the percentage is for weapons grade, but it's not, it's not much more than that. It's not going to take them a long time to develop weapons grade uranium and produce a bomb. And they, uh, the latest intelligence is that they have enough to produce five bombs. So this is extremely uh, serious and extremely dangerous. And as a result of the uh, decision of the Obama administration, which was uh, irreversible, that they're not going to back the Israeli position, they, it's okay with... Uh, uh, them, if um, uh, Iran gets to 20% enrichment, then uh, Iran said, okay, then we're not going to, I mean, uh, Israel said, well, we won't go along with any previous agreements where, where or feel bound to any previous agreements where we wouldn't attack before the presidential elections uh, in November. I mean, there's just so much cloak and dagger and Machiavellian in and out. You just, and we don't get it all. You, you just you, we don't get it from reading what we read over here, and you don't get it all reading over there. There's just a lot of different different things that are going on. But the Iranian position, according to uh, Yah alone, is that <clears throat> nothing is going to happen in 2012 uh, since it's an election year in the U.S. And there was this uh, until uh, Netanyahu put this new coalition together. There was a thought there would be an election in Israel in September. Uh, this isn't going to happen, so uh, it looks like it's just going to keep going. So it's playing right into the Iranians' hands, and they're just going to continue to do what they're doing while everybody in the West tries to feel good about the fact that we're still talking. But while we're still talking, they're moving ahead as fast uh, as they uh, possibly can. And so we just need to be uh, aware of those things. So that's my little report on um, on that this evening. And we need to get into the Word. Uh, Romans chapter 5, 12 to 19. Now, it's been a few weeks, so I'll give you just a little brief review until we get into uh, some of the new material. Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 14. I pointed out that at the uh, starting in verse 12, what Paul is doing here is developing a comparison and contrast between Adam and Christ. Adam as the first Adam, Jesus as the second Adam. Now, what makes Jesus a second Adam? What makes him the second Adam? Adam and Jesus are both, both enter into this world without a sin nature. They both enter into the world in a state of absolute perfection. But what one thing that Paul is saying here is that's not true about any other human being. So Jesus can mirror Adam's decision in, the same, in his true humanity because he doesn't have a sin nature. And even though he is fully God and he is in hypostatic union, as we've studied before, hypostatic union means that Jesus is fully God and fully man, but that he isn't using his divine attributes to handle the problems that his humanity faces. So when Jesus, as a man, is tempted, he is not accessing his holiness and his righteousness and his omnipotence on the divine side to handle the problem of, of temptation to sin. He's handling it through his reliance on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, just like we do. If he was handling it by relying on divine attributes, then his pattern of life would have no benefit for us because we have no divine attributes to access. So Jesus is handling whatever problems he faces in life on the basis of the Spirit of God and the Word of God, which sets the pattern uh, for us. That's the whole point of the, of the kenosis, is that he is willingly 
restricting, limiting his access to his divine attributes. It's a it's it's sort of an interesting firewall between the two because there are times when he does access his divine attributes in order to demonstrate that he is God. When he changes the water into wine, he's doing that. This is an act of God as the creator to demonstrate that he controls creation and he is God. The same thing when he exercises control over over the demons. He is doing this from his position of authority as, as the uh, eternal second person of the Trinity. He's not doing it out of his humanity. He's doing it from his, from his deity, but he's not... Remember, he's casting the demons out to solve the problem of the demoniac. He's not casting the demons out to solve temptation problems in his life or personal assaults on his life uh, in terms of the angelic conflict. So that's, that's the difference. Jesus uses uh, his deity to demonstrate that he is God because he has to do that as part of his credentials as the Messiah. But he's not using the deity. He shuts off that firewall uh, when the issue has to do with his own personal relationship to God or dealing, dealing with tem- temptation. And so he comes in as the second Adam to do what Adam failed to do the first time. Adam failed to say no to temptation. Jesus is going to say no to temptation all the way to the cross, qualifying him to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. And as the second Adam, then he is going to be the one who's able to fulfill the original Genesis 128 mandate to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, uh, the beasts of the field, etc., so that... Uh, in in Jesus, as the eternal Son of Man, man is going to finally rule over creation. And we are in Christ, so the church participates in that rule via our position in Christ. So that's why it's important to understand some of the aspects of this particular uh, analogy between Adam, the first Adam, and Jesus as the second Adam. So he begins his comparison and contrast, and then in verse 13 he immediately runs off on a rabbit trail in order to make sure before he builds the analogy that everyone understands the issue of the origin of sin and the transmission of sin and the guilt of the entire human race, and that that guilt is not based on our personal sin and that guilt is not and, and corruption and penalty is not based on our personal sin or our personal sin nature but the reason we're all condemned is because of Adam's sin we're not condemned because we sinned we're not condemned because we have sin natures we are condemned because Adam sinned and in Adam's sin there is a, a corporate biological, genetic unity in, in among all human beings such that Adam as both the physical head, and that gets into what we talked about last time in terms of the view called seminalism, and Adam as the designated representative head, which is the view called federalism, both are true. It's not either or. It's that both are true, that in that position, Adam's sin is what's the basis for for our condemnation. So we're born condemned under sin before we ever do anything because of that organic unity back to the first Adam. And this is why Jesus is able to pay the penalty for the sin of every human being because he is organically, genetically tied to every human being. Now that's that's really important because that also means that Jesus can't die for the angels. Because there's no organic unity there. There's no connection. And I just heard today, sadly, of a doctrinal pastor uh, who has now started teaching that, that Jesus died for the angels. And, and this is what happens when you don't really understand theology very well. Uh, and you don't understand the, the core issues here in terms of the, this organic unity of the, of the human race. So... In verses, beginning in verse 13 and 14, uh, Paul goes down this, this uh, sort of this rabbit trail. 
And he says, for until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So we'll get back into that and explain that in just a minute. And then in verses 15 through 17, there's a contrast between Adam's sin and grace in relation to Christ. And then in verses 18 and 19, uh, Paul connects Adam's sin and condemnation with Christ's obedience and justification. So we're going to we swing right back into justification. So he answers the question, how did death spread to all men? We've covered this, and he says, in this manner, or thusly, he says, death spread to all men because all sinned. And the implication, the point he's making, is they all sinned in Adam. Just like your representative, and it was interesting this last week because we all had an election. Anybody here find out they have a new Congress? Congressional representative? Um, yeah, I just found out we shifted from Culberson's district to Ted Poe's district. I'm sure glad I'm not in Alan Westfall's district because he's got, what's her name? Sheila, <laughs> Sheila, whatever. I would, you know, I'm just, praise God for that. Anyhow, and the, our election judge agreed with me. He said, is that good? Yeah, we just don't have to put up with that. So we've got Ted Poe. So there's a change. But Ted Poe, John Culberson, or if you're as lucky as Alan is to live in Sheila Jackson Lee's district, then you get to whatever decision she makes, she's his representative. That's his decision. Don't you love that, Alan? I don't know where he, where he went, but that's your decision because she's his representative. And if you live in her district, she's your representative, and her decision is your decision. If I was a Baptist, I'd say, do I have an amen here, just to (laughs) give everybody a little bit of a hard time. But that's the point here, is Adam's decision, you may say, I wouldn't make that decision, but God in his omniscience said, eventually you would. Eventually every human being would. And, and God is perfectly just in setting up that system. So it's in that manner, death spreads to all men positionally in Adam. And then we covered the two different views that have been developed uh, in theology. One is called seminalism, which is the view that God uh, considers every human being to physically participate in Adam's sin because we're all uh, physically, genetically related from father to son. And uh, <clears throat> this view is usually related, as I pointed out, to a traditionist view, which really has more to do with a materialist view of the transmission of the soul. But, but there's elements of seminalism that are true. There's this organic unity in the human race because we all go back, actually, we all go back to Noah, and through Noah, we all go back to Adam. So there's this organic unity in the human race. Then in a, opposed to that, there was the federalism view, and it sort of ignores the physical side, just as the seminal view sort of ignores the representative side. And in federalism, Adam's sin is viewed as, he's viewed purely and solely as that representative. And what I'm saying is that both are true. He is both a, a representative or the federal representative of the human race, but there's also the organic unity. They're both true. They're both present. And then I sort of looked at the historical aspect of the Pelagian view. This is the left-hand column, the Arminian view, the federal view, and then what became known as the Augustinian view. That's just your Theology 101 lesson. So the four questions that, are, that we cover in this section that have to be answered are what is sin, what's the penalty for sin, What's the sin nature's relationship to the corporeal human body? And how is this passed on? Now, this is really important, and you may not realize this. Some of you do because you're a little more aware of what's going on. But uh, there are uh, most Christians, and many Christians, think that the, the sin penalty that's, that's, that's uh, la- laid down in Genesis 3 is physical death. That's the primary penalty. And I'm going to show you why that's not true. And it's, it, it's a real problem if you think it's, it's physical death. It has to be spiritual death. And I've had uh, discussions with theologically astute individuals who try to argue that, uh, that, it's, that it's physical death. And there's several segments of solid people, solid evangelicals, who take it as physical death. But I'll show you why it can't be. 
Then we have the, the third point, which is, what's the sin nature's relationship to the corporeal human body? And this is really important because you run into these phrases that Paul uses, flesh, to refer to the sin nature, and in its non-metaphorical or literal meaning, flesh refers to the physical body, the physical makeup of the human being. So why does Paul call it flesh when he's not necessarily talking about just the physical makeup? And it's called the body of sin. And then as we studied in, um, in Colossians 3, the aspect of the members of your body, why, do, why does Paul seem to always go to this physical aspect? And that's, that's part of understanding the answer to that question. And then the fourth question is, well, how is that sin nature then transmitted to, uh, to the next generation? So the first question is, what is sin? And I want to look at some of the Hebrew words for sin and then the Greek words for sin. The core Hebrew word for sin means the same thing that the Hebrew word is going to mean. It is chata, uh, which means to miss the mark, to miss the target. So we, I found this little cartoon out on the Internet. I usually never find cartoons that fit with what I'm teaching, but this was a good cartoon. And see, he doesn't even hit the target at all. That's what sin is. We miss the mark. We fail to hit whatever it is we're aiming at. And so man never does achieve that which fits with this, the character of God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as we've studied that phrase, glory of God, is a term that refers to the totality of God's, God's essence. We just don't measure up to God's, uh, God's standard. Uh, Isaiah uh, 64 uh, five, that all our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. So we miss the mark. That's the first word. Each of these words adds a different dimension to what sin is. This one focuses, it's the j- most broad word. It means to just disobey God, to miss the standard, to fall short of it. Um, it's, it's, the, it's used in a literal sense in passages like Judges 20, verse 16, talking about the Benjamites. They were primarily left-handed. They were southpaws. Among all this people were 700 select men who were left-handed. These were their, their, their best archers, every, or slingers, rather. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Now, when I was in Israel this last, last week and at the... Um, at the antiquities wing of the Israel Museum, they had on display there some of the stones that were found, I think, at Lachish, which is south of Jerusalem, where uh, there was a huge siege from by Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, by a Sennacherib, and these the stones that the slingers sling were about the size of a golf ball or a ping pong ball. Okay, so we're not talking about a BB, we're not talking about pellet size, we're talking about a pretty serious stone, and they could hurl those uh, with fatal accuracy at 200 yards, uh, documented. Now that's pretty good, and here these archers from the tribe of Benjamin can't, they're they're only, they're not going to miss the target by a hair's breadth, they're that accurate at a long distance, and they don't miss chata. They don't miss the mark. So there's a literal use of that, of that term. It's also used in Proverbs 19.2. Also, it's not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he misses the mark who hastens with his feet. He's not going to have success. That's the context. It's not talking about sin, really, per se. Uh, Proverbs 8.36, but he who uh, sins or miss, misses the mark against me wrongs his own soul. That's the personification of wisdom here. Uh, he who sins against me, that is, who fails to live up to the standards of wisdom, uh, wrongs his own soul. Uh, the second major word used for sin, it, in English we translate both of these words as transgress. And that's important for this passage because transgression implies a known, uh, an, a, a, a known law. Okay? So transgression means to violate a specific law. The first word is avar, which means to transgress. It also means to pass over, to go through a country. So you see where it gets the idea of trans, uh, transgress or move across a, a boundary. And then the second word is uh, uh, fashah, meaning a rebellion, 
uh, or a revolt, and it focuses on that aspect of rebellion against an authority. But both of them imply that there is a clear standard, a specific command that is being violated. Then you have the word ra, which is translated evil, and uh, aven, which is also translated evil, but also is translated as wickedness and emptiness. So these describe sort of a, a, a a complex of issues related to what sin is. It's ultimately missing the mark, but it's a transgression of law, and it brings about evil, evil and wickedness. On the Greek side, you have the word hamartia, uh, <clears throat> which is used uh, uh, three times in Romans 5.12, and indicates missing the mark, which is missing the standard of God's, uh, God's character. And notice, sin is not defined as something you do to other human beings. I can't sin against you, and you can't sin against me. We can only sin against God. That's what Paul, I mean, what David said when he confessed his sin with Bathsheba. Here he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had seduced her. He had then conspired to have, uh, have uh, Uriah, her husband, killed, put into the hottest part of the battle so he would, he would be killed. So he's guilty of manslaughter or, at the very least, second-degree murder, uh, perhaps beyond that. And and so he has harmed m- many other human beings, and not to mention the consequences that come in terms of the divine discipline. But his sin, he says, is only against God, because the standard is God's standard. The standard is not some human being's standard. It's God's standard. He violated God's, uh, God's standard in violating all of those commands. A second Greek word is parabasis, which means to transgress, to go around uh, in, in um, uh, geometry. You have a parabolic uh, diagram or whatever. It's been a long time since I've had uh, <clears throat> geometry. But it has to do with that which, which moves around or goes around. Parabasis is an offense. Uh, it means to transgress or break a specific law. And we're going to run into that uh, here in this passage in Romans 5.14. And then you have partoma, which is another word often translated transgression, and it means to violate a moral standard. It's used 19 times in the New Testament and five times in Romans 5. So that tells us that there's a real emphasis in this aspect of sin um, in this particular chapter. And then there's parakoe, which is translated... uh, it's an act of disobedience related to a specific act. And then plane, uh, which is used as the idea of wandering away, getting lost, and it's used figuratively for error. Then anomia, which is the absence of law. It's translated lawlessness in 1 John 3, uh, 4. Uh, so it's a rejection of God's law. And then the then there's the word adikia. Greek has a lot more words than Hebrew. Adikia means unrighteousness. And in 1 John 5, 17, John says all adikia, all unrighteousness is sin. And so that is a, whenever you commit unrighteousness, that's a sin. That makes, makes sin a pretty broad category. Then there's the word paranomia, which also has to do with namas. You hear that in the second, uh, second uh, word there, para, meaning to go around the law. Paranomia, meaning something that's contrary to law, also translated transgression. So all of these are involved in understanding sin. So it's through this one man that sin enters the world. And I pointed out that the word translated enter here isn't just ace erkamai. It's another compound of, of erkamai indicating that it just, it just spreads. It just mushrooms down through all of humanity. And then it says, and the death. There's a uh, Greek uses the article with the noun thanatos for death here. Why does it use the article? Why does it say, why should we translate it, the death? It's going to bring out something that uh, is is really significant uh, in understanding this particular passage and why, why Paul uses the article here. You would think that if he didn't use the article, that it would emphasize in Greek the lack of the article doesn't mean it's indefinite. It just means he's emphasizing the qualitative nature of the noun. 
So with death, it would, without the article, it could be in, in, emphasizing the qualitative nature of the death. But he's, he's using this in a distinct sense. So uh, that is going to lead us to the question of what kind of death this is. But before I go on, I want to say about six things in relation to, uh, in relation to sin and the words that we've just studied. First of all, the, the, these different uses for the word sin are also applied in different ways. Some of them are used uh, for personal sins. Uh, which are the infractions of individuals. Uh, sin itself in the singular can refer to at the, the sin in its, in its ultimate origin, and, and, or it can refer to sin as the sin nature. So the, there are different nuances, different emphases in each one of these words, and so it's important to pay attention to what words are used. Uh, second, when it refers to the sin nature... It's referring to that capacity to evil that is developed uh, with Adam. Now, you, you, you don't, are probably not aware of this, and it's not something you necessarily are going to engage in, but just for general knowledge's sake, you ought to know that at the seminary level, there's a lot of debate over whether or not there's, there's a sin nature. Now, the reason is because they want to argue about what the word nature means. And often some of these arguments um, are not too far off from talking about how many angels dance on the head of a pen. But that's not the stupid argument liberals want you to think it is either. There, all these things have significance. And, and, and it's a, really a, a debate over the semantics of the word nature. And I think that it's, it's a reasonable debate. It's not unreasonable because if you look the word nature up in the dictionary, it has a multitude of meanings. So if you're not clear as to which nuance of nature you're using, you could go off, off, off course. And I have always thought that uh, Charles Ryrie had one of the best, most simple. It's uh, the sin nature is a capacity to sin. It is the capacity to sin that comes from the corruption from, from Adam. And it's not talking about the fact that there is a physical something inside of us that is that we could almost open up like a surgeon could and say, ah, look, there it is. Right next to the cardia, there's the sin nature. Okay, and see, some people want to take nature as having that kind of a meaning. So this is why you have these kinds of debates. Sometimes they seem silly, but, but um, it helps hone and refine our thinking. Theology is a lot to, is in very similar to law, which is why a lot of theologians were also lawyers, and there, you have to clarify words. You can't just assume what, that everybody understands what these words mean. And sometimes I think people might think I get a little too uh, focused on refining some of these things. But we have people that come into, the, into our congregation that come from, and I've always had this, come from all kinds of backgrounds. When I was in Connecticut, I had a lady in the church who had grown up in a hyper, hyper Pentecostal family that took their heritage all the way back to Azusa Street in Los Angeles in like 1905. And, and one, the other side of the family were Quakers. This woman just almost floated on a cloud of mysticism. And yet, so, so when I would teach, especially on a spiritual life, she was really struggling to understand what I was saying because all the vocabulary I used had been given completely different meaning in all of her background and training. So it wasn't that she was negative. She was just as confused as she could be and needed to redefine all of her vocabulary. And part of that is always answering, asking the question, why do I need to redefine it? Why are you right in what I was taught wrong? I just need to understand this. And so we always have to go through this kind of process to help people understand uh, what is being taught because you never know what their background is. Sometimes I don't know what their background is, but we always have to assume. Th and who knows who they're trying to explain it to? And who knows who's listening over the Internet? So we always have to keep these things clear. Uh, third point, so the first point, there are different uses for the word sin. Some refer to personal sin, some refer to different aspects of that, uh, the kind of sin. Second use has to do with the sin nature, the capacity to sin. 
Third point is that sin is sin because it violates God's character and his righteousness. Um, it's never understood as violating some, some sort of standard that is external to God. God is not holy because his holiness conforms to an abstract standard of what is right. God's character is what is right, and that is what defines justice, is what God is. And, and ever since the uh, midpoint of the, uh, or, or, excuse me, the early part of the 1800s, with the shift to Kantianism, uh, people uh, who have been influenced by liberal Protestant assumptions or liberal German assumptions of the 19th century are rationalistic, and they want to assume that when you talk about righteousness, that's this abstract category that exists, that free floats out here, and God conforms to it, and then we can talk about that. But God, in the Bible, God is righteous. His character is what defines it. It doesn't exist outside of him. And so we have to understand that sin is always defined in terms of God's righteousness. It's not talking about some category that's external to God. Now, I'll show you, give you an example of how you see this every, every day in America. In American history, you've had social sins that, are, that, are, that, that become super elevated ab- above biblical sins. In the 19th century, you had uh, sins related to child labor. You had sins related to temperance. You had sins related to slavery that became major, major focus of reforming society so we could have a utopia. That's what they believed. If they could just clean this up, if they could do away with slavery, give women the vote, get rid of uh, child labor uh, practices, and get rid of the uh, evil alcohol, then we would have a utopic society. And now it's the, you've got to get rid of smoking unless you live in New York City and you have to get rid of big gulps. Just want to make sure, see, who so the ones who laughed saw the news today, the ones who didn't, didn't see the news today. Bloom, my, Mayor Michael Bloomberg got there announced today that what he wants to do is outlaw any sugary drink that comes in a size of more than 16 ounces. No more big gulps. You can't get a Vinny Starbucks uh, maqui- caramel macchiato anymore. You can't get a uh, Venti, or now even Starbucks has a larger size than that, of a uh, my favorite, which is the uh, uh, peppermint mocha, iced peppermint mocha coffee. I get that in the big size and take all my calories in one gulp. But m- almighty government now wants to, wants to tell me I can't do that. They want to protect me from myself. See, this is what happens when it's a complex of problems, but, but it happens because whenever in a culture that people are giving, uh, when people start giving up personal responsibility and not fighting to maintain personal responsibility and freedom, then somebody's always waiting in the wings to suck your freedom away from you and your responsibility away from you and take it over. And that's exactly what we see happening today is that people don't want uh, they, they want to point their fingers at everybody else and say, fix that, fix this, fix this other thing, and they want, uh, you know, the nanny state. So in New York, they're getting it. And, he, you know, today we have these, these social sins being overweight. It's going to be a big social sin. There's going to, there are, I, I was predicting this 15 years ago, there was going to be a fat tax, that there was going to be additional taxes on foods that had more than a certain amount of fat in them, more than a certain amount of sugar in them, because what's going to happen as we move move towards the government being responsible for more and more health care is the government's going to want to control what you do. Because if you do things that contribute to less than good health, then they're going to end up paying for it. And so, like when I was in uh, Canada a few years ago and I w- went to a very nice restaurant and ordered a hamburger, I discovered that in Canada you can't, it's r- illegal to serve a hamburger cooked less than medium to medium well because you might get uh, E. coli or something. And then the government would have to pay for your health care. So we can't do that so nobody can get a good tasting hamburger anymore. You can just get a hockey puck and pull out your, your saw and cut it in two, have no flavor. So it's just terrible. Now, the fourth point is that sin first entered the universe through a creature, 
God didn't cause sin, but God created, had an environment where people could exercise their volition. And what that meant was they could choose to do not just little bad things, but really bad things. And the reason I point that out is because people who have bought into liberalism and the basic goodness of man also, even though they don't always realize the connection, they also have bought into the idea that when certain really evil things happen, that that must be God's fault. If God is really a good God and he really knows everything, he wouldn't have allowed the Holocaust to take place. He wouldn't have allowed... Uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki to take place. He wouldn't allow a smallpox epidemic or the flu epidemic like the one in 19, uh, was it 1917, 1918, at the end of World War I. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't allow that. So he must not be a good God or he must not be very powerful. What they don't understand is that God has created uh, the hu- human race with volition. And if they choose to do evil things, God's not going to move in and pull away the consequences of that. To do that means that God can, would be controlling volition and ending freedom. So you're either going to believe in freedom or you believe God ought to control everything, but uh, if God's going to have freedom, you're going to have real evil. So sin first enters the, cre- the, the universe through a creature called in the Hebrew, Halel ben Shahar, translated as Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, by his own unhindered volition. Fifth point is that the second determinative sin is that of Adam in Genesis 3, which brings the present world into condemnation and all of Adam's descendants into condemnation. And it impacts us in two ways. It impacts each one of us in terms of of an inherited corruption and sin nature and the imputation of Adam's guilt to that sin nature. So that affects every one of us in those two ways. We receive a sin nature, and Adam's guilt is imputed uh, to that sin nature. Now, that means we're all born spiritually dead, so we end with the question we started with, which is what kind of death is this going to be? And uh, just very briefly, I'll take about two minutes because we've covered this many times, there's all kinds of death in the Bible. Spiritual death, physical death, the second death, which is eternal death, Operational death, uh, that's a typo there, James 2.26, uh, which is we're alive but we're living like we're a dead unbeliever. Uh, positional death, which is the position w- uh, that we have in identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Temporal death, which is also another way of talking about our being out of fellowship. And sexual death when we can no longer uh, uh, procreate. Uh, that's mentioned in Romans 4.16-21. The question I asked her is, how do we know that that core, de- core death in Genesis 2.17, when God said, when you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will die, that he meant spiritual death? It's because in Ephesians 2.1, Paul says, uh, though you were alive, you were, he made you alive, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So that, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins is the status you're in when you're physically alive prior to salvation, but you're dead in some sense. It's not physical. It's spiritual. There, this demonstrates that there is a clearly biblical teaching on spiritual death, and that's mirrored in Colossians uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12 as well. So, back to Romans 5.12. Through one man, sin entered the world and death. Not physical death here, but spiritual death. Spiritual death is the source of those other deaths. So this is sort of a a plenary use of the word death. It implies all of them. Death in all of its manifestations comes in through uh, Adam's sin. And it spreads to all men because all sinned, not their personal sin, but their position in Adam. So we'll come back next time and move forward from 513. I thought I'd get to 19, but I I didn't, but we will next time. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things. We continue to pray for our nation, pray for our president, pray for those who are in leadership positions, both within the bureaucracy and those who are elected, that they might 
uh, be wise in dealing with the threats to the West, the threats to freedom, the threats from Islam, the threats from Iran. And also we pray for wisdom on the part of those who are in leadership in Israel as they uh, are much more involved, much more on the front lines for us as the initial line of resistance against the onslaught of the tyranny of Islam. And, Father, we pray that you would give them wisdom and skill in handling their threats. And, Father, above all, we pray that we might be faithful in communicating the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ to all those around us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.